I should stop, though, and mention you've probably heard uh, in this committee about the bylaws that are the new uh, a trend, at least in British Columbia. Many of these towns and cities have come up with Controlled Drugs and Substances Act bylaws, and they now call them Public Safety Bylaws, and, and uh, they passed uh, legislation there that um, uh, if you have high hydro, they report it to the municipalities, and then they come and knock on your door, and they put a 24-hour notice uh, that they're going to come and inspect, and then they come with a huge team that used to be like a SWAT team, but then they, the courts have stopped the police. The police now have to at least stay at the end of the driveway, they come and they basically go through your house looking for a grow up. Um, they look in drawers, they look in cupboards, they look all over the place for these grow ups. And if they find a little thing here, a little thing there, you get fined uh, $5,000 for the privilege of having this inspection. You have to redo your drapes and your curtains, you have to fumigate your house, and all these sorts of things. And uh, they don't charge them. And that is the only thing that I think has been limiting the amount of grow-up cases that I've been getting. It's only when the police charge that I get a case and go and argue search and seizure and so on and so forth. So there is this civil, non-criminal approach that is being taken in British Columbia, which apparently is being quite successful uh, compared to the criminal approach. Now, as I see this bill, though, as a lawyer, the bells go off because I see all kinds of overlap which is just going to fuel my case when I take it to challenge the constitutionality of the bylaws, is invading the criminal law power because you have occupied the field so well, and, and by this bill, will occupy the field almost specifically to overlap with some of those bylaws, which will provide me with evidence to take that case in order to challenge the bylaws. So, um, please also look at the chapter from the Sentencing Commission on Public Knowledge of Sentencing, because that's very, very important. If you really think that you're sending a message, um, this chapter points out that this is just not the case, that, that most folks just don't know what's going on in this sort of area and don't react in relation to it. What the chapter on mandatory uh, minimums makes clear is that what happens is sure you don't affect the judicial discretion in relation to serious cases because serious cases get more time than what you're providing for in your mandatory cases from the current judges today. And that's, again, as others have said, I don't know where this notion comes that the judges are soft or the judges aren't uh, <laughs> doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's certainly not my experience. Uh, but it points out that what you do is you catch the lowest person, the person who is just on that borderline um, of being a serious offender, and the judge's uh, discretion is taken away there. Where he, most, he or she most needs the discretion, that's where you remove it. Um, last week I was in Nelson, British Columbia. Nelson, as you may know, is considered the marijuana capital of British Columbia, at least by, by the news media. I'm sure it's not considered that by others. But, uh, Many, many people in, in Nelson are re reported to have been in the marijuana industry and are in the marijuana industry. And I had a man who uh, was busted uh, for 300 plants, uh, 150 small ones, clones, I'm sure you've heard of that, uh, and 150 two-footers. And uh, he uh, was charged, as usual, with uh, production and possession for the purpose of trafficking. And uh, the, the police officer, the main police officer, got ill, and so there was a one-year delay as a result of the officer getting ill. Uh, in the meantime, he managed to get his business together, which was building custom motorcycles. He managed to get his son over from Scotland and to get him in an apprenticeship position and to, to start going to school. And he was really working everything out and doing very positive things. His lawyer had recommended that he go to trial. He asked for a second opinion. He came to me. I looked at it, and I said, no, I don't think a judge is going to toss this out. I think you're going to be convicted. He accepted my opinion, and so we went up and we pled guilty to the production count. Um, if this law was in place, the judge would have had to sentence him to time inside. And the two years of his reformation and rehabilitation that had gone on getting a job, a business, getting customers, clients, and so on, all of that would be disrupted, and he would end up in a prison, and the whole thing would fall apart. His son would have had to go back to Scotland, 
And so all of the good work that was done between the date of the offense and the date of the sentencing would be undone. And so I say to you, that is the type of injustice that you're going to create by having these types of mandatory minimum sentences. The, he got a 12-month conditional sentence order, the first six months of which is complete house arrest. He's only allowed out for work purposes specifically um, and medical purposes, things like that. Um, his, uh, the, the next three months after the first six months is uh, still house arrest but with a curfew from, if my memory serves, I think it was from uh, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. He has to be in his house. Uh, and then the, more relaxed for the, the last part. In order to try, we try to structure the conditional sentences similar to a sentence of imprisonment, one-third, 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 at least some of us do. I don't think that's common across the country. So a uh, conditional sentence is a sentence of imprisonment, uh, but uh, this bill, uh, and I should add, the conditional sentence came about as a result of all of the stuff we did back in the 80s and 90s, First the Sentencing Commission, then the Dobney Committee. Now the Dobney Committee, wasn't that, wasn't that a conservative uh, government at the time? And, and, and as I looked uh, through it, that was August of 88, as I looked through it, I see a picture there of Rob Nicholson, PC, Niagara Falls, Vice Chairman of that committee. That's the current Minister of Justice, am I right? So. This report, which followed on the, the Sentencing Commission report, which said no mandatory minimums, this also said no mandatory minimums. Now, I think, uh, exception, of course, for murder and high treason, we've had uh, a min mandatory minimum life sentences for those offenses forever. Uh, somebody suggested we've got lots of other mandatory minimums. We don't. We've got, uh, a, few, we've got a few firearms ones uh, recently. We've got the uh, <coughs> impaired driving second, third, uh, you know, we don't have any mandatory minimums for sex assault. We don't have any mandatory minimums for serious offenses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, you want to have mandatory minimums for nonviolent offenses. Now, I've heard the argument about drugs as, you know, potential for violence and so on. It comes up all the time in front of the parole boards. The parole boards are always trying to turn Schedule One offenses or I should say Schedule II offenses, nonviolent offenses, into Schedule I offenses because they say the potential for violence. Well, of course the potential for violence is there. It's because you're using prohibition. What do you expect them to do? They can't come to us lawyers. They can't go to the courts to resolve their contractual business disputes peacefully. They have to shoot each other. They have to beat each other up because they're operating in a black market. When you operate in a black market, that, that's what people do. You know, if I ripped you off for a few hundred thousand dollars and you couldn't go to judges and lawyers, what would you do? So you send them to prison. Well, what happens when they get to prison? They form gangs. They form gangs in prison and they become better gang members in prison. And then they come out and they've got this number of people in prison and people out of prison in order to operate the, the continuing business. Um, and uh, that's what I've certainly seen in, in, in my years of experience. Now, I <laughs> note the time <laughs> and realize that... But you I are obviously, to, you're uh, obviously steeped in this, Mr. Conway. Well, I've just been I know you so could, long. <laughs> you could testify for the next four hours and not scrape the surface of all that you know. And the, we don't have a whole lot of time. The however. problem is, is that as a result of all of going through all of this and all of these years of making submissions and trying, you know, seeing what the Corrections and Conditional Release Act currently says, which was a product of all of these uh, things, seeing what the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act says, which is a product of all of this work in the past, uh, seeing what Part 24 of the Criminal Code says, which I've included, by the way, Section 718.1, 718.2, all of that. That all came as a result of Sentencing Commission, Dobney, the Green Paper, and so on. And so I now uh, say, as a result, when I keep seeing these things come up, it's a line from a book by Doris Lessing in African Laughter, there is no one more furiously cynical than an idealist betrayed. Thank you.